Okay, for all of you that uh, went uh, that uh, went through physics in school, it's called the Bernoulli effect. You put air through a smaller area, and it increases the the speed, the velocity of the air. So uh, now you've had your physics lesson. We'll start. We'll try to do a, a Hebrew lesson here. Okay. I feel cooler already. Let's begin with the blessing. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kiddushanu B'mitzvotah B'tzivanu L'asok B'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with his commandments and commands us to engross ourselves in words of Torah. Okay, <clears throat> this morning, we're starting a new book. Devarim is both the title for the last book from the scroll of the Torah, and it's the title of the first Torah portion therein today. Devarim means words. The English-speaking wor uh, world calls this book Deuteronomy. Now, the Hebrew title for the book comes from the opening phrases of the book. These are the words, the Devarim, which Moses spoke to all Israel across the Jordan in the wilderness. That's in Deuteronomy 1.1. Now, the ancient name for the book of Deuteronomy is Mishnah HaTorah which means repetition of the Torah. This is similar to the Greek Septuagint name Deuteronomos, which means the second law. So the English name uh, Deuteronomy then is derived from Deut Deuteronomos, the, the Greek name, okay? So now you've had a little bit of Hebrew lesson, you've had a little bit of Greek lesson, a little bit of history, all right, so it's not a total loss today. The book of Deuteronomy is dominated by Moses' farewell address to the children of Israel as he urges them to remain faithful to the covenant and prepares them for entering into Canaan. During the course of the book, Moses reviews the story of giving the Torah at Sinai, the trip to the promised land. He re reiterates several laws of the Torah, introduces new laws, the book seems to follow a general pattern of an ancient Near Eastern Covenant Treaty document. So, as we study this first week's reading from the book of, uh, of uh, um, Deuteronomy, the children of Israel are assembled on the plains of Moab across the, book, uh, across the Jordan from Jericho. They're about to finally enter into the promised land that had been denied to that older generation. You remember that uh, generation that came out of Egypt? Even though the faithless generation had died out during the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, I'm fairly confident that this current generation remembered the stories of the 10 spies who said there were giants in the land. There, were some, uh, deep there was some deep-seated fear that kind of gnawed on them, even though they were excited about finally getting to go into the promised land and cross over the Jordan to claim their inheritance, finally, after all these years. Some of these people were 60 years old, and they'd been wandering around since they were 20. And I believe, personally, that uh, there were some people in there, the women who uh, were not counted in that census that did survive, and that whole generation did not perish. It's just it, because it says several places, the men who were in the census died out. Didn't say the women died out, okay? So there may have been, there may have been some women there that were closing in on their 80s, maybe. Who knows? So they're excited. They're getting ready to go in. Both God and Moses understood that fear. Moses didn't scold them or call them cowards. Listen again to the, the words that Moses uh, used to encourage them. He said, I commanded Joshua at that time, saying, Your eyes have seen all that Adonai your God has done to these two kings. Talking about King Sihon and Og. Adonai will do the same to all the kingdoms you are about to cross into. You must not fear them, for it is Adonai your God who fights for you. 
Moses commanded Joshua to be bold and fearless. Just as the Lord had defeated the Amorite kings, he would give Joshua victory over the rest of the Canaanites. Remember, there were a lot of those ites out there, the Hittites and the whatever. I mean, the, uh, the Canaanites and, and uh, I can't remember all of them, just a bunch of ites, okay, Amorites. And uh, um, so Moses said, don't fear them. Fear cost that first generation their opportunity to, re, uh, to enter into the promised land. Remember, they were fearful. They didn't want to go because all they heard about was giants in the land. And so um, Moses carefully crafted his address to, uh, to Israel to give them confidence in God and certainty in his power and his promises. He aimed to bolster their faith, lift it up, even though they would no longer be crippled by their fears. They, they did not. He wanted them to be fearless. Fear is the opposite of genuine faith. Fear comes from a place of faithlessness. When we have real confidence in God, fear is driven out. When we feel frightened or worried, we must remember who our Father in heaven is and that he cares for us and watches over us. I don't know if any of you, uh, if you can remember back when you were children. I'm, uh, yeah, that's... The older I get, the more I can remember back when I was a child, but I can't remember what I ate for breakfast yesterday, you know? So, but do you remember ever being afraid, being frightened as a child, scared of the dark, you know, scared of this, scared of that. Um, scared of getting on a yearling bull, trying to ride him for eight seconds. <laughs> but anyway, be that as it may, um, things would frighten us, especially like in the dark. But if your mother or your father were with you and they just reached down and grabbed your hand, where did that fear go? It vanished. It's gone. Because why? Because they've got, your father and the mother are there. They're going to take care of no matter what. All those boogeymen, they can't touch it because mom or dad is there. It's the same way with God. That's the feeling that we should get. Paul tells us, for we have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, a familiar name, familiar term for God, okay? Uh, the Bible repeats the command, do not fear, more than a hundred times in various permutations of do not be afraid. And fear not. Uh, the words uh, do not be afraid occurs five times in this por Torah portion alone. Just what we read uh, today, which is only um, less than three chapters. It may not sound like uh, one of the commandments of the Torah, but it, it is a rule for life that uh, you know, for people of faith. Okay, Maybe it's not a commandment, but it's just one of our rules. Don't be afraid. We live in confidence of the strong hand of God. He delivered Sihon and Og. These were two big kings of the Amorites, one of those ites, uh, into the hands of uh, Israel. And he will also deliver the Canaanites into the hands of Israel. He who rescued our master and savior from the grave will also rescue us from every trouble and fear. If you spend time, any time at all, on the, on the uh, time-wasting machines, those are, uh, you may know it as the internet, okay? You'll run across advertisements that warn you of the coming economic meltdown and that, uh, you know, they'll, they'll uh, other things will say, uh, uh, you know, that talk about the, the climate change and how that we've only got five more years to go and the world is going to end. 
I remember them saying back in the 60s, we're going to have a new, uh, we're going to have a, uh, uh, another ice age and we're all going to die because of the ice. We'd like to have a little of that ice today. There's no shortage of fear mongering on the web if you, if you stay on it any time at all. Each site then has their own solution. And for the low, low price of only $39.99 plus shipping and handling, you too can be safe and secure from the upcoming apocalypse. Place your order now before su supplies are all gone. Does that sound familiar? You know, yeah, kind of. <laughs> Yeshua had an answer for the fear of tomorrow. He said, are we not spare, two sparrows, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them shall fall to the ground apart from your father's consent. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered, so do not fear. You are worth more than many sparrows. I told you as a child, whenever I would see, I knew this verse as a child. And so whenever I would see if there was a bird that had somehow run into something or it died and I saw it, I'd go over there and stand right over the bird, just stand right there on it. Because I knew that God was looking down at that bird because he knew that that bird had died. And so if I'm standing over the top of it, God's looking at me too. And I wanted him to know I didn't do that. Rob Shaul, the Apostle Paul, had some encouraging words for the Messianic community in Rome. Being in Rome had both advantages as well as disadvantages. It was the economic and governmental center of the world. Everything was happening in Rome. That was one happening place. Rome was a very prosperous city. It was, had lots of money. And, uh, but it was the home of the Roman Empire with its evil and crazy emperors. You know, like Nero and Caligula and uh, some of those other cats. It was ground zero for the future persecution of believers in Yeshua. Lots of stuff the Roman believers had to worry about. They, there was lots of stuff there. But Paul said in this, the Amplified uh, uh, Version, and we know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God to those who are called according to his plan and purpose. Now, that's in Romans 8, 28. And uh, um, no matter what comes our way, if we're a true believer... We can rest assured that the creator of the universe, he's got our six. That's, that's a military talk for, you know, he's back there behind us and he's looking when you go into, into situations that um, you, you always need somebody that's, that's looking behind, behind you so nobody, the bad guys can't sneak up on you in the back, okay? And uh, um, that's... Another story. I'm not going to get into war stories. Okay. While it may be true that the things that come our way may be a test of faith or discipline sometimes, uh, the end result is for our betterment. Sometimes God just throws things at us and says, how are you going to handle that one, buckaroo? And uh, we don't want to drop the ball. Paul also puts all of our trials and tribulations in perspective. And actually, we should print these verses out and put them on our refrigerator so that you see it several times a day. Romans 8, 31 to 39. And I'm going to read them all because they're important. What then shall we say in view of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Right there, that's one good one. Just put it up there on your mirror as you, uh, as you get up in the morning. You look at that. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? 
It is God who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? It is Messiah who died and moreover was raised and is now at the right hand of God and who it also intercedes for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Messiah? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or IRS or FBI, any of those guys, can they, yeah, they could probably throw you in jail for saying something like, I believe that I should have a role in my children's education. And uh, therefore, say those words out loud enough times and you become a terrorist. You're a domestic terrorist, just, just so as you know, all right? So, uh, uh, but it says, that's not going to separate us from God's love. In fact, he might be saying, yeah, go for it. As it is written, for our sake, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. But in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So that's another verse that I like. We're more than conquerors. A conqueror just goes through and just wipes out everything. And he, he's the, you know, uh, he's the man. Well, the Bible says we're even more than conquerors. What's more than a conqueror? I don't know. But it's good. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, things to come, or powers, nor height, or depth, or any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Messiah Yeshua, our Lord. There is nothing on this earth that can destroy our souls and, and ban us from spending eternity with the Lord. There's nothing that can do that. There's nothing Satan and all his minions in today's woke society can throw at, throw at us that can harm us. Yeshua has already defeated Satan. All this junk that we see on TV and the, uh, the internet and all that kind of mess is an aggravation, <clears throat> but we don't need to fear any of it. We cannot be defeated. In our Torah reading this morning, there's another sentence that I would like to point out. It said, I commanded Joshua <clears throat> at that time saying, your eyes have seen all that Adonai, your God, has done to these two kings. Again, talking about Og and Sihon. Adonai will do the same to the kingdoms you are about to cross into. My amplified version, uh, you know, the, the Sheik translation here, says, Joshua, you have seen with your own two eyes everything that Adonai, your God, did to those kings, Sihon and, Ga and Og. Remember, one of them was a giant. Adonai will do the same thing to all the kings and all of their armies over there across the Jordan. He told him, don't be afraid. One of the blessings that we have been given is memory. God calls on us actually to remember stuff. On Rosh Hashanah, we are commanded to blow the shofar and remember. It doesn't tell us what to remember though. He says, uh, you know, what, are we, what do we remember? Okay, we remember Recall all the good things that the Lord has done for us. Remember how he gave his only son as an atonement for our sins so that we would be uh, in right standing with him. He has given us eternal life with him. If you look back in your own lives, I'm sure you can find things that were nothing short of a miracle. Maybe all of us have. And if you, haven't, if you don't have any of those kind of deals, come up and see me and I'll give you some of my miracles that I'll tell you some of my miracles that God has performed for our family. Where some blessing that, uh, you, that probably should not have come your way fell right into your lap. You know, that, uh, where serendipity just has a, has a way of just kind of jumping up and... and, uh, and and grabbing hold of you. How about a time where you might have been injured in sports or in an automobile accident, but somehow you made it through? Do 
you grew up on a farm in West Texas or in East Texas, you know all about that stuff, don't we, Ed? <laughs> oh, boy. God was there for us. Even if you didn't recognize it at the time, you know, I could, I could regale you, like I said, with, with all day long, with stories about God's provision in the lives of my family members and friends. So what's my point? God has been there for you in the past, and he will be there for you in the future. John 12, uh, 14, 12 says, A man and a man, I tell you, he who puts his trust in me, the works that I do, he will do. Greater than these he will do because I'm going to the Father. Now, Yeshua performed many miracles during his short ministry on earth. John said that all the books of the world would not be enough to contain all of his works. And yet... That was not the end of it. Yeshua said that if we trust in him, we can duplicate those works. Not only that, Yeshua went a step further and he said that we could do even greater works than he did here on earth. Now, that's, that's a lot. Greater works does not necessarily mean more spectacular Okay, because, wow, what can be more spectacular than to go over and touch a leper and then all of a sudden all of that yucky old skin that's dead and, and he stinks and everything like that, all of a sudden you look at him and his skin is just like a baby's skin. That's spectacular. Or the little girl that's dead and Yeshua says, hey, girly, wake up. And she comes to life again. That's pretty spectacular. Have you walked on water lately? That was pretty spectacular too. Greater works means greater in quantity, not necessarily in quality. Although the things that I, that I said about healing... And raising from the dead, that is a promise that the Lord gave us in, in uh, Mark uh, 16. So the, these are the signs that will follow those that believe. One of the things, you'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And you, you can raise people from the dead. Speak with a new language. You can handle snakes if you want to go ahead. Um, but not me. I handle them with a long-handled hoe or a shotgun. But normally I have a hoe in my hand, or, you know, much, much more uh, uh, likely that I'd have a hoe in my hand than a shotgun. I don't like snakes. But, you know, I'm a believer that some of you had to take that, uh, that uh, phony jab to keep your jobs or to get a job. And I'm a firm believer that we as believers have protection against that. So many people took that jab and then what? They've got problems now. Okay? And I know some of you had to take it. And I'm, I'm just a believer and I'm believing with you that nothing's going to happen to any of you. We've already prayed for people. We had a, a healing line up here one day. And that, uh, that just believing in, in God's word that nothing is going to happen because of that. That's where it, taking that anything poisonous in, in uh, Mark 16 said, if you drink any deadly thing, then it will not hurt you, okay? So we already know that when the government tells you you have to take a shot of something or this or that or the other, you better take it under advisement and not do it, you know, because they lied to us like a rug, you know. And so, anyway, I did not mean to get into politics, and, and somewhere it was in there. All right. Um, Yeshua was a human being at the time and was restricted to being at one place at one time, okay? He would not go and show up in the Galilee and also at the same time in Jerusalem. No, he was a man. He was wherever he was, that's where he was. 
However, now there are millions of believers all over the globe filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Simultaneously, people are being healed in Asia, in Africa, in Europe. At the same time, people are being saved, delivered from demonic oppression and possession. People are being raised from the dead through the power of the Holy Spirit all over the world at the same time. There is no end to the victories that could be ours if only we would reach out in faith and do them. He promised it. He wants us to get out of our comfort zone sometimes. You know, it's, it's nice to be comfortable and uh, just st do the same old thing because it's routine and it's habit and, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to do. But, you know, I think God wants us to get up and do something different. Go over and speak to that person that, uh, uh, that you know, if you ever get a little inkling, of, uh, you know, that you see somebody and, and uh, you think, oh, that, that person looks like they could use a, a friend, you know. And that, that's hard for me to do. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not one of those, uh, you know, overly gregarious kind of guys that, uh, that um, you know, and I don't try to fix things. Now, my wife is a fixer. That's just the, whenever there's a problem, she's got to fix it. Me, I can say, not my, you know, I don't know how to fix it, and I'm not going to offer any advice to somebody. I don't have that kind of, uh, you know, I just don't have it in me. Uh, but, uh, you know, if I can help somebody, I will. But if I don't know the answer, I'm not going to go in there and tell you, okay, you need to do this or that or the other. Um, because I'm just more cautious that way. And I'm not like yesterday, day before yesterday, I met, uh, met this guy at a master gardener thing. And I says, hey, do you live on such and such a street in Sealy? And he said, yes, I do, right on the corner. And I said, yep, that's, I thought I saw you uh, working in your garden. I said, my daughter lives on that street. He says, yeah, I know that. Uh, I knew that. Uh, uh, he says, I've never met your daughter, but I've sure met your granddaughter. <laughs> and, uh, and I told uh, uh, Cynthia about it yesterday, and she says, oh, yeah, he's, uh, he's the one that's got three dogs, and one of them's only got three legs. And so uh, uh, Zion goes down there and talks to the dogs, and, and everybody on that street knows my granddaughter, because why? That's just the kind of personality she is. Boy, she'll talk to uh, anybody, and, and it's just a delightful young lady. And so, you know, it'd be nice to be more like that. I'm just not. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a grouchy old man. And I think sometimes maybe God wants me to get out of being such a grouchy old man and be nice to people, talk to them. That would be out of my comfort zone to, to really... Just go out. I mean, I can do this kind of stuff all day, but I mean, just uh, like in the mall or something like that. Some people have this this ability to look at, zoom in on somebody that that they're troubled, and they can go right up there and talk to them and be friendly to them and and uh, just you know brighten their day. That's a great thing to do. Great thing to do if you can if you can be that way. God did things for Israel, and then he's going to do them again. He did the miraculous before they went into Canaan, and then once they got into Canaan, that is a whole nother set of circumstances there where um, they would go into battle, these massive battles, and not one single Israelite was killed. Now, how could you do that? Have you seen Braveheart? Okay, that's the kind of battles they went into with these swords and then just swinging swords and everything. If you, didn't get, if you didn't get hit by the enemy, you're liable to be hit by one of your friends as he's trying to swing this great big sword around <coughs> or a spear that he's chucking out there someplace and hits you instead of the enemy. But no, God directed everything. 
miraculously. Some of those battles, no people were lost. Other times, there were people lost. Why? Because there was sin in the camp. But it was miracle after miracle. He did these miracles all the way through the times of the judges. Look at, uh, look at Samson, you know, with his rapid-fire donkey's jawbone, where he, he went around and, and, uh, and uh, killed bunches of uh, Philistines with, with what? The jawbone of a donkey. And uh, it's amazing. We were in uh, Beth. Beth Shemesh in Israel at an archaeological dig a few years back. And we're digging through the stuff, and guess what I found? I found the jawbone of a donkey that was 2,500 years old because it was in the strata there where you know, we knew how old it was. We knew the history of that, that village. And uh, I was really surprised to see right there on the on the jawbone says Samson no not really but there was you know it's it was only about this long what what was what uh, what was amazing to me though was that the bible says that Samson killed i don't know a thousand uh, uh, however many it was philistines with a with a jawbone of a donkey in his hand he didn't have a sword he just whooped up on him with this you you don't think that's god doing that Absolutely. Saw so in the judges. Look at uh, look at Gideon. Gideon was a coward. He was hiding, trying to gr uh, grind some corn, grind some grain, but he wasn't doing it on a uh, on the threshing floor, where it's out wide out in the in the open or something. No, he's hiding over in an old wine press, so that nobody would see him. He's trying to grind up some grain. And uh, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, scared the bejeebers out of him, you know, and uh, told him that he was going to go against uh, the, uh, the enemy. And so he gathered up after a lot of, uh, lot of uh, um, persuasion. He gathered up. He had an army of 10,000 men. And the Lord said, no, that's not that. No, we're not going to do that. He says, so they went to this spring, and I've actually been to that spring, and uh, I just grossed all of our, uh, our tour group out because I went over there, and just like the men of Gideon that, uh, that were allowed to go into battle, I reached down and grabbed some, uh, drank some water out of that spring, looking around. And uh, they says, ah, you can't drink out of that spring. Look, there's bugs on the, on the you know, there, on the water. And uh, our tour guide said, he's been to survival school, I can tell. They said, what? He says, those kind of bugs there would not, uh, would not be there in polluted water. This water is good to drink. He said, I would drink out of that water. It's perfectly good. So I went to that, saw that. It became real for me. So God got 10,000 soldiers and squoze them down to 300. They went up against the enemy, and they won. With what? A pitcher in their hand and a candle and a shofar in the other hand. That's a miracle. He did lots of those kind of miracles. The Maccabees. How could they defeat one of the greatest armies in the world with their ragtag little army there in Israel? They did, because God gave them the victory. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still in the miracle working business today that he was back then. Do you, have a, do you need a miracle in your life? Georgette needs a miracle. I forgot to write her down on, my book, on, on that sheet of paper. She needs a miracle. There's others here that need a miracle in their life. It's right there. We have seen answers to prayer right here in, in Tree of Life over and over and over again. We've seen relationships healed. And I can't tell you 
how many times people have requested prayer for a job or a new job with better benefits or a, a better boss or something like that. And, uh, and in almost every case, God gave them that job, sometimes that very same week. Now, the problem with that was, I, you know, I'm, I'm now to the point where if anybody asked me to pray with them that they could uh, uh, get a job, I'm really reluctant to do that because with the exception of just a couple of you that are still here today, uh, I prayed for you to get a job and you stayed. All the other ones got the job and they left. Once they got what they wanted from God, they were gone. Don't do that. We pray for you and, you, and the God answers that prayer in the affirmative. Stick around and tell, tell everybody else about it. You know, we need you here. Yeshua knows what you need even before you ask it. It won't be a surprise to him. You know? It's, oh, I didn't know you had cancer. Oh, excuse me. No, he knows if you got cancer. He knows that if you need a job. He knows that if your car is broke. Have you ever prayed for your car? Absolutely. <laughs> I have. So just go ahead and ask. With the help of God, Israel defeated two powerful enemies. They slew the giant king Og of Bashan, and later in the conquest of Canaan, God did it again, and other giants fell. Remember a few weeks ago, we talked about my hero in the Bible, Caleb, where he's 85 years old, and he says, I am well able to take this mountain, even with its giants. The giants heard that Caleb was coming. They left and went to Gaza. They absolutely, they did. They abandoned uh, Hebron and said, Caleb is too strong for us. 85-year-old man. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, sometimes we face giants in our own lives. Um, but we need not fear them. Yeah, we're going to have giants. We're going to have people that come up against us and and uh, uh, you, you just don't have to be afraid of it. It's the Lord who fights for us. Remember that what? Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. Another great, great verse to put up on your mirror, on your refrigerator or wherever. And uh, I, uh, I looked back. We used to, in the singing group that I, that I had back in the, 70s, yeah, yeah much, some of you weren't born then, I know. But anyway, we had a singing group, and we traveled all over the uh, southern part of the United States. And that's one of the songs that we sang was Greater is He That Is In Me. It's an old Lanny Wolf song. And uh, it just, I never got tired of that song. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. So we can, we can conquer lots of things. We're, in fact, we're more than conquerors. We can face those giants. We sang the song today. I can face my giants with confidence. We don't have to be afraid. Because why? It's God that is going to defeat them. He's defeated them in the past, and he is going to defeat them in the future. He said, I've done it already. You've seen it with your own eyes, and I will be doing it again. So don't be afraid. Things are, things are happening to all of us all over the, I mean, every day. You know, I get phone calls, people wanting prayer for this or that and the other. We pray for them because why? It's an evil world out there. Bad stuff happens, but you don't have to be afraid of it. When it comes to your, it comes to your door, okay, devil, it's you again, out. Because guess what? My God is able to do whatever it takes to get rid of you. And we don't have to be afraid. There's no reason at all to be afraid. Uh, and I'm not so sure if I should quote that old uh, 
uh, FDR thing. We have no uh, have nothing to fear, but fear itself. I just say we have nothing to fear, period, because God is with us. Could we stand? We'll close out in the uh, and uh, yeah, Michael. If you'll go, uh, you go holler at the kids and, and bring the uh, tell them that we're done, so we, we can get everybody in here. Avinu Shabbat Shemayim, our Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given us the promises that you are going to fight for us. We don't have to be afraid because our Abba Father is with us. And he is the one that can control everything. <clears throat> we don't have to be afraid of anything or anyone or any spirit, any power. There is nothing on this earth that can destroy our spirit. Father, we just pray right now that you would strengthen each and every person that is here within the sound of my voice, either here or on the electronically. We pray that you would put that, that uh, spirit of courage in them. Because it said that you did not give us a spirit of fear, but of a, of a sound mind. Father, we just pray that you would touch each and every person here, that we would not be afraid, we would be encouraged, we would be strengthened in your word, in, in your Holy Spirit. We ask all of these things in the name of Yeshua. Amen.